So before we begin our curriculum presentation, um, I'd like to reflect on one important aspect of this project. Uh, the project started out with, with six students in two tutorials receiving um, two credits, which they'll tell you without hesitation was not nearly enough uh, for the amount of work that went into this project. Um, but the, the, the vast majority of our team uh, received no academic credit, nor were they paid. Um, they joined the team and worked long nights and weekends because they believed in the project and wanted to do work they felt was meaningful and relevant rather than write papers that would sit in their archives for years and never be revisited. Um, when I first approached Grace McGuan about this project um, at the end of last semester asking if she'd like to join the curriculum design team, she was immediately enthusiastic about the prospect of creating something that was generative and meaningful. Um, she says, my time at school has been spent in classrooms problematizing and contextualizing and historicizing. Um, and by my senior year, I felt fatigued by this process and left class wondering to what end. Gallatin is so good at teaching students to be critical, but rarely teaches us to be generative. Critique is an important skill, but it ultimately means very little for the world if it is not used to build something new, stronger, and better. Um, one core aspect of our curriculum design was what we call problem projects. Uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, but I wanted to reflect a little bit that this, the, the, this project as a whole was one big problem project, and I hope that the enthusiasm um, that we've managed to generate around this project is proof that students are ready to be more generative uh, and participate in more project-based learning um, approaches. So with that, let's begin. Okay, so do we <laughs> want to go just across and introduce ourselves first, and then we'll do a really brief overview of the curriculum. We have an awesome discussant here, so we want to jump to that as quickly as possible, so we'll just do a really quick intro. I'm Elena. I'm a senior graduating on Wednesday. Um, <laughs> my major is public policy, so I'm actually in CAS, not Wagner, but it's been a treat to sit in. Um, yeah. My name's Jessica. I'm also a senior graduating on Wednesday. And I'm in Gallatin, and I studied race, inequality, and the law. My name is Grace. I am in Gallatin as well, also graduating Wednesday. And I, my concentration is called the Postcolonial Politics of Language. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm also a senior graduating on Wednesday. Um, and I concentrated in uh, technology, philosophy, and education in Gallatin. And we have an intro for Heather that we don't want to no, we're gonna we're gonna make you wait, and you'll figure out who she is. <laughs> She's fantastic. Um, so really quickly before we jump into the curriculum, we just want to go over what our guiding principles were when we were designing these courses. Um, you're gonna see that we don't see this as a one size fits all curriculum or a solution by any means to the issues that we've seen in K through 12 education. But we do want to make sure that our intentions are really clear um, and the guiding principles that really informed us when we were making these courses shine through. So the first would have been um, empowering students. We really fi think that students finding their own agency and their learning is incredibly important. Um, we want to strengthen the community. We'll talk a lot about the school as a community center um, and the school as an aspect of the community that it exists within. And then the third um, is polis. Uh, we talked about creating a holistic education that creates someone that's a full person, um, whatever that means to um, any individual student. We don't really want to center around a higher education goal or a vocational goal, when in reality we want to create engaged citizens of the world. Um, and so we thought that polis was probably the best word to encapsulate that goal. And it relates to our, the title of this project, the Paideia Project, which Jim Fraser commented on earlier, which is really the, the, uh, the holistic rearing of the ideal citizen for the polis. Um, and this is what we focused on in our curriculum design. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a really good segue into this first course block that we um, touched on, which is narrative. Um, so narrative is designed to satisfy a lot of the humanities requirements that we see in high schools today. Um, particularly in narrative, we want students to be focused on project-based learning. You see that in a lot of our courses. Um, but narrative specifically, it'll be a three-week curriculum uh, that begins with a teacher presenting a story as full of a version of this story as possible. And in this story, they'll be able to access their own passions about that particular issue. So the teacher's interests are brought to the forefront right at the beginning. 
That part of the unit takes about three days, and then students break off either into groups or pairs or individually and focus on a certain aspect of that story that they find incredibly moving or they find their interest lies in. Um, one example that we used was the Flint water crisis. Uh, you can take a look at that from a political stance, an ethical stance, a scientific stance even, um, and this is all different students accessing their passions in a different way. Um, and then they come together at the end of this three-week unit and present from their groups to, their, uh, to the other students. So it's students teaching students based on their passions. So a lot of the different blocks that we're going to be discussing are a bit of a more alternative approach to education and bringing in things that we see are really missing from a traditional school structure. However, with that being said, we do need to have the basics covered. So the tutorial is really going over math, science, computer science, tech, some of the main things that we do need to keep within our school so we don't go too crazy. And um, so some of these would be geometry, biology, pre-calc, et cetera. But with these still being basic content, we're still incorporating experiential and project-based learning so that it remains um, very interesting and engaging and, again, focused on student agency. Great. So uh, Josh mentioned the problem projects earlier, um, of which this is, in fact, an example. Uh, they essentially eliminate the question, but how will I use this in my real life, in the real world? Because students choose at the beginning of each semester a problem in the real world um, that they want to learn more about and then also develop a way of addressing the problem. So they spend the semester meeting twice a week. Um, they could do it in groups or individually. Uh, again, um, learning about the problem as well as developing some kind of way to address it. So a student, um, and a problem could be on, on any scale. It could be as small as addressing a problem within the school itself to as big as uh, a problem that's global. So a student might choose to um, design and then implement an irrigation system within the school, or another student might choose to uh, research voter ID laws and then develop a template for reaching out to your representatives about the voter ID laws. So um, then at the end of each semester, students will present their, uh, their problem projects, kind of like we are, um, at an expo, which is open to the rest of the school as well as families, the community members, and other stakeholders who are interested. And then lab, uh, one of the things that we found really inspiring about uh, the school that we used as our template was that they had an entire vocational wing with an auto shop and woodworking shop um, and that there was this uh, important emphasis on vocational training. Um, I think it's, uh, as we heard from uh, Kath earlier in the panel, I think it's really important that students play with physical objects and that they're generative and that they create things um, that they can showcase at these expos. Um, and so the lab block focuses on developing skills uh, that students can then use later in their career to further their problem projects or their presentations that they may do for their narratives. So if they're building an irrigation system, they may fabricate those um, pipes that capture the rainwater from the on top of the school roof uh, in something that they create in the, in the wood shop during their lab block. Um, the lab block would be separated into three distinct uh, lab sections on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Monday they would have arts lab where they would learn graphic design and drawing and sculpture. Um, and they on Wednesday it would be a tutorial block so that they can have hands-on experience with the tutorial that they're studying. So if they have they're taking calculus um, or physics, they can create a, a catapult and do the, the calculations for, um, for that project. Um, and then on Friday, uh, they would have their, uh, what we call trades lab, which would be woodworking and metalworking, um, so that when students graduate from high school, they have this strong skill set that one looks great on, on their applications, but also, um, uh, gives them more opportunities for employment after high school. Community. So we're hearing a lot about community, but what does it actually mean in the school context? One of the things that we talked a lot about during this entire project was that social and emotional learning, empathy, compassion, these are all really missing elements in a school. And so instead of just doing community service and having the pressure of students to just do good because they need it for their college application, we want to incorporate a community idea where you're learning about the space that you're taking up, you're learning about the people that are around, not just in your school, but the surrounding areas and really learning what social responsibility, activism, these incredibly important elements that are oftentimes missing from a school and from a young person's life. 
Um, and so the community block is also on Friday. And it's going to be a really great way to learn about diversity and, again, the space that they're taking up and understanding why and who the people are that are surrounding them so that we're not ignorant of the space that we're in and um, are really learning not just curriculum within the school but taking it outside and understanding why it matters. I think the, the other opportunity, just briefly, for community blocks is um, we have a, a lunch block that's separated and, and there are short community blocks during at, on every day. Um, and you heard earlier in the architectural presentation that we have these um, food trucks in the student center, or these vertical gardens in the cafeteria. Um, and our idea around this was that the students can, can run um, these facilities that are open to the community, um, one, gain experience in managing sort of small businesses, um, but two, really feel like they're adding tangible value to their community um, collectively. Great. So. Sorry, I just wanted to hop in and say that we have an amazing discussant here and we definitely want to access as many like questions as possible. So while these might seem kind of overarching, um, we're going to get into the details with her and her questions um, just briefly. Yes, and um, as, I, as we've mentioned, we've kind of th thought of the Paideo project as a problem project in action. And so we've had the opportunity to see what it, it kind of feels like in, um, and how it happens in the world. So we spent four months working really hard on it, but that said, we have spent only four months on a massive education redesign. Um, so we think of this project less as a prescription for what education should be and more of an offering um, into an ongoing conversation about what education could be. And we recognize that conversation began long before us and will continue long after us, and we're just really excited to be able to be part of it. Um, that said, we know it's not perfect, and we recognize it as a real work in progress. Um, so when we're looking at uh, potential ways to research and um, continue developing the process uh, or the project, one way that we found um, would be really interesting is to take this kind of customizable template that we've used, uh, we've developed for the curriculum, and actually put it into a, um, a specific community to see how, how that functions there and if the structures we've developed for support are actually supporting uh, the community as we've designed it to. And that would allow us to see where our success successes are um, as well as you know pinpoint places for um, adaption and ways that we could continue to grow um, and keep this project as part of this larger conversation about the future of education. So, oh. Let's, um, we're just gonna put up this uh, example of a possible schedule. We kind of explained th where the blocks fit in throughout the week, but has, having a visualization is really important. Um, so we're gonna have uh, just the credit system as well explained really briefly, and then we'll go into the questions. Do you wanna explain the credit system? Sure, so um, one of the <laughs> things that we recognized early on about this um, very flexible uh, curriculum design is that you still need to make sure that students reach certain milestones in their educational experience. Um, and so we devised a, a sort of um, overarching credit system so that when students uh, explore a perspective in their narrative block or focus on a, a certain problem in their problem project, if it relates to one of these um, uh, credits, they can apply, sort of send a proposal to their advisor or the, the teacher of the narrative, um, and they can sign off and say whether they've received credit for this. Um, this way, and you'll, you'll also notice that um, 48 credits are elective. So we imagine that at the end of your high school career, you'll have filled out this progress bar and it will show clearly um, where you have put your emphasis and, and your focus on during your high school career. Um, yeah. So with that, we are grateful and honored to have Dr. Heather Hamanoff Woodley here as our discussant, who is herself an educator and much more knowledgeable on all of these topics than any of us. Um, and so I'm just going to briefly read her bio because she's very impressive and very awesome. Um, she is a teacher, educator, researcher, writer, activist, and public school parent. She is a clinical assistant professor of TESOL and bilingual education in the Department of Teaching and Learning at NYU Stein. Heart. Her teaching and research focus on meeting the academic, linguistic, and social emotional needs of emergent bilinguals, particularly Muslim immigrant youth who speak less common languages, and supporting teachers to create inclusive, anti racist, and creative classrooms. Heather was a Fulbright scholar in Morocco, earned her PhD in urban education at the Graduate Center, Sydney University of New York, and taught middle and high school English and humanities in the Bronx and Washington, D.C. Underachiever. 
obviously. Um, but um, also just from personal perspective, she is absolutely incredible and we've only spent a little bit of time with her, but she's already taught us a lot and we're really thankful that she's here with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it is really wonderful to hear from these young people and see their dreams in action. And I think my most exciting part about this project is because it really thinks about real systemic educational change that's not just funneling more money. And that it really looks at what we need is creativity and redesign, not just higher thresholds of budget, which makes this all much more hopeful because this could happen. Um, so with that, <laughs> let's jump into some questions. Um, so my first question for you, and this is really thinking about a lot of this as from the side of both an educator and a parent of school children. Can you explain, you've talked a little about the um, community connections, but could you talk about how your curriculum builds on not just connections, but actual family strengths and family knowledge? And how does your curriculum honor the knowledge or what we call the funds of knowledge that come from families and communities? Well, I think the community design, specifically in the community block, but as well as the idea of the school as the community center is a really key part to answering your question because in our minds, this school, and for those of you who saw the ac architecture um, presentation, you'll also see that there are a lot of shared use spaces in this school. The Student Affairs Center, it, that atrium, that really replicates a community center for this town. So the whole idea is that families, parents, siblings, um, and grandparents, obviously, can all interact with each other in this space, um, as well as the teachers. And so we've created a student government structure that you can look at um, outside um, that really harnesses the strength of the various inputs and creates the school as a feedback loop rather than a source that people would input their knowledge into with nothing coming back out of it. It creates a dialogue between the school and the community that I think really taps into like familial skills or knowledge um, that you might not see in a traditional school. Also, just to briefly add, um, one of our focuses on vocational training is that, you know, parents or families on the outside with those strengths and skills can come into the school and we want to incorporate you know the entire community not just keep it within a, a rigid school structure and in addition things like a community garden and different activities that really are bringing people together rather than keeping us all separate one of the other things that that we recognize with our design is that we put an emphasis on the teacher as a coach and mentor rather than someone as a, who's a lecturer who has um, all knowledge of their of their subject, and um, one thing that this allows us to do, I think, is to increase the number of uh, student to teacher ratio because administrators also become teachers. They can help be the advisor for a problem project that's focused on business. Um, but another possibility for this is that we invite parents um, who are specialists in, in certain fields into the into the environment um, and have them be the advisors for these certain problem projects or other community endeavors. Um, and I think that would be a great way to engage families in, in the curriculum of the school. Thank you. Um, so I really like the way you talked about meeting the needs of the whole child. So I want to take that a step further and think about how do we do that for all young people. Um, so the first thing I think about when I think about teenagers is that high school is not the only thing they have going on in the day. Um, in lots of our communities, young people are caregivers for younger siblings or they themselves are parents. We have young people with part-time jobs and a lot of responsibilities. So my question to you with this creative curriculum is looking at flexibility and building on a wonderful idea that you have about student agency and self-directed learning. So my question is, thinking about the focus on student agency and self-directed learning, how can your school be flexible to the scheduling or real life needs of high school students, whether it's the care they have to provide, the jobs they have to have, the real life. Yeah, um, I think one of the ways we're doing that is by taking things that are normally extracurriculars and we're building them into the school day. So um, community service, which you might usually do after school, um, is now built into the curriculum during the day. Um, and additionally, kind of clubs and activities can meet during the lunch hour and the community hour that's paired with it. So you're not staying after school or coming early and eating up that extra time. And then additionally, because our curriculum is like very, uh, very problem 
project, uh, project-based learning, problem-based learning. Um, the homework is not going to be busy work. For the most part, you're going to be developing projects, and most of your time in class is going to be spent um, working on those projects, and there's going to be a lot less like lecture-based um, class time. So um, if students are using their time well, they like ideally, they shouldn't be spending that much time outside of school doing homework. I also want to just really quickly touch on something that we talked about when we met last week um, that's been something I've been thinking about ever since is particularly students in a caretaker role or um, for siblings or for their own children and how that would interact with the way this school has been designed. Um, first and foremost, I want to go back to the schedule really quickly because you can see that there are free periods incorporated, but also all of these classes are centering around an advisor advisee relationship that kind of opens a feedback loop right in right away that um, a student can express their personal scheduling needs to an advisor. And there's no reason that the hour and a half that one uh, is supposed to work on their problem project from 3 to 420, but if they have to pick up another sibling from school or something like that, um, there's an easier way of communicating that rather than seeking an excuse for excused absence or something like that and as it would be in a traditional school. And we also talked a lot about how um, students can really take their problems um, and the way that their, their, inter their education interacts with their life and make it work as a problem project or make it work as something like that. Like something we talked about even was the idea of carpooling and how can carpooling, which is something a lot of high schoolers are already engaged in, how can you make that something that the school really takes on as a problem project? And how much more efficient can you make this school if you find a way to interface a carpooling like Uber app with the students that are in the school already. Um, so that that was really exciting, and I know you brought it up last week, so I wanted to talk about that a little bit. We also brought up having students who would run a daycare, and if there were students who needed, you know, like thinking about all of these different entrepreneurship is very big right now. Like there are a lot of different things that can be done that are supportive, and then also giving students a job if they need that. And one of the main things we discussed also in our project was. Um, and I know somebody on the panel spoke about how the doors close at 8.20, right? Like, we're going to have our doors open early, close late for those who need it. It's supposed to be more of a community than, like I said, a very kind of rigid, rule-oriented structure. And I think this really um, builds on what the group set as some of the f um, foundational principles with empowering students. A lot of times, if you look at high school as this is when you need to build up your resume for college and think about all the students coming from various economic backgrounds who have to hold a part-time job who can't get in those extracurriculars. By making them part of the day, you're really giving them the space and empowering them to take part in these activities and it's not being held against them that their afternoons are already busy or they already have obligations. Okay, so building on that idea of this as a space for all students, um, let's think about some of our students who um, are often left out of some of these educational discussions. So the first group that I always think about are our multilingual students, our emergent bilinguals, our students who are the English language learners on paper. Um, so what are some of the ways that your school can both support emergent bilinguals but also support multilingual families? So how do you see this school as being inclusive linguistically or culturally? I think that starts with an overall philosophy. Um, of teachers and educators and administrators um, in the school that is never an English only space. Um, like we, educators should never demand that students only, um, you know, speak or write or interact in a certain language. Um, and and so it begins as a kind of overall philosophy, but that plays out in a lot of different ways. Um, one of those is that there's a ton of flexibility in how students will uh, present. Um, or engage with their learning, and a lot of that can be done digitally. Um, and so they might not even be presenting, um, you know, like linguistically, they might be using um, pictures or other things that they may feel more comfortable um, communicating through. And there's, are there some other ways you would like to Yeah, know? I think um, something Heather actually mentioned was that understanding that these are not just teachers that are teaching their exact subject, but they're also language teachers, you know, like there needs to be flexibility and multi-dimensional understanding of what your job is, which we often see is missing in a lot of teachers. Um, 
and and also going back to the community aspect, which is one of our main priorities and principles, is that there are people in the community that can help with translating, that can come and support students who need that support. It, again, doesn't have to be a traditional structure. There is space for more learning and engagement that can support both the students and the community as a collaborative force. We have time for like two more questions. Okay, great. Um, and one thing I will just add that we had talked about that I want to highlight for the group um, is the idea of students helping students. Yes. So you have more bilingual students with language strengths. How do they, you know, work on their tutoring skills or their support of other students? All right. Um, and going with that idea of some special populations of students, thinking about how can this be a space for students with disabilities or IEPs? How might this meet their needs or be a place where they can achieve without lowering an expectation? I think um, something that we've discussed a lot is that a lot of students with uh, special needs or IEPs, that comes from not having an, an, a malleable curriculum in the first place. It ha I, that comes from students not being able to learn in maybe a lecture-based course or ways that we traditionally understand high school being taught. So just in the redesign itself, involving a lot more hands-on and activities-based learning um, will really open the doors for a lot of different learning styles, which a lot of the times is what we're talking about when we're talking about um, developing an individualized learning plan. Um, but also we think that this isn't a one-size-fits-all solution, as we've said um, a few times, and we'd be really interested to hear about how the people in the audience, but also just various educators view the student to teacher relationship and how that would impact um, having someone vocalize that they're not learning the right way or they're not learning the way that they would want to or in a way that harnesses their thought process the best. Um, we think that increasing this like student to teacher ratio and creating a more advisor um, and peer to peer interaction on the day to day would allow students to vocalize what they want from their education a lot more. Um, so that's just one way of that I think. Just to briefly add also on the topic of student agency and empowerment, we would hope that with the empathy and compassion that we're incorporating into our curriculum, which is often not there, um, it's, it's also adding to an environment that's supportive and you know, student to student, there can also be relationships that are helpful for those who do have disabilities. Um, and again, the student to teacher is really important, but also um, working so that the kids, the students are helping each other and that it's a very, um, community feeling rather than just as a brief aside uh, as I was um, visiting the, the school that we used as our template um, to take pictures and um, to learn more about the community there uh, I struck up a, a really interesting conversation with one of the janitors who had recently graduated or graduated um, five or six years before um, and he shared he has a learning disability as ADD and he shared with me that he was um, really bullied ruthlessly by the um, the sports teams for um, getting distracted in class and, and one of the things that he told me was that he would run away to the horticulture program that the school has. Um, uh, additionally, the, the, the horticulture program actually generates a large amount of revenue um, that is, is used in the school currently. But um, the, this particular alum uh, shared with me that he, uh, the, the teachers there were always welcoming of him and he could work with his hands and that that was uh, a really empowering experience for him because he could, rel he could relate what he was learning in chemistry um, to something tangible and physical that he could see and play with. Um, and although he failed all of his chemistry exams, um, he went on to like create his own garden in his backyard because he learned something um, from that experience. So uh, I think emphasizing that will be crucial. Um, it's really great to hear all about this. It's also from my perspective, being in schools and seeing how little schools have changed in 200 years, mm -hmm. um, it's really nice to see such a fresh um, look at schools and gives us a lot of hope thinking that these are the people who might actually be creating schools and making policy about it. Um, and really, you don't bring this up, but I just see students enjoying this. And I think when we think about schools, we're like, no, don't let them have fun. But by all means, have fun. Think about the stuff that you love and it's, you, you know it more because you're genuinely enjoying it. And when I look at this kind of project, all I think about is, wow, where was that when I was a kid? And I would have loved this. And when you love it, you learn it better and you learn it more. And I think that's a really wonderful takeaway from the way you've laid this out and empowered students so much. 
because so often 16 year olds are looked at like, oh, you're just a teenager. But if we learned anything this past spring, it's that teenagers are gonna be the ones who are, knock on something, mm -hmm. uh, changing policies out there. So I think you really go with that idea of being respectful to young people, to teenagers, respecting that when they say they're interested or they know something, they actually do, and empowering them in that way. Um, so I really thank you for the creativity and the ideas behind us. I think just to conclude too, I, it's important that we acknowledge that this project could only exist in a school like Gallatin. Um, I think there's a reason that we're here. Um, Gallatin gives a lot of freedom and agency to their students and uh, this project basically came about um, from this tutorial structure, which is separate from our tutorials, but um, it allows students to propose uh, classes that they would want to take uh, and find an advisor to, to mentor that class like we've done. Um, ben Brooks Shout was our advisor uh, for <laughs> our section and Mitch Joachim was, <laughs> was the advisor for the, for the architectural section. Um, and so I, I think it's important that, that you know, we acknowledge that uh, it, it works. Um, empowering students really does work, and, and I think this project is proof of that. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. So that concludes our formal presentations. Um, we're going to have a great expo uh, session now with a bunch of other students from Steinhardt and schools across NYU, and there's Pi, because uh, <laughs> Paideia Project tried to get Paideia, but they wouldn't let me. Um, so, uh, so please join us. Thank you.